Council, I'd like to welcome you to Unity Place and to tonight's presentation. I hope that you'll be able to stay with us after the event. We have an informal reception downstairs in the Fellowship Hall and hardcover books will be available of this beautiful book, Counting on Grace. And Miss Winthrop has graciously agreed to sign any of those hardcovers if you should so desire. Um, take care of a little bit of housekeeping. The restrooms are out in the hallway. Ladies on my left, your right, and gents are on the right. I know you'll enjoy tonight's presentation, and I look forward to seeing you again sometime back here at Unity Place. We have performances and events going on through the year. And I would like to pass you over to Anne Penninger, who is the president of the Friends of Gaston County Public Library. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Um, I'd like to thank the following organizations for their collaboration in the Standing on the Box community uh, project. The following. Gaston County Public Library, Gaston County Museum of Art and History, Preservation North Carolina, Gaston Arts Council, Friends of the Gaston County Public Library, Gaston County Historic Preservation Commission, the Levine Museum of the New South, and the Gaston Gazette. Tonight we are pleased to have Elizabeth Winthrop, the author of Counting on Grace, which has been the Gaston Reads book selection. Ms. Winthrop is the author of more than 50 works of fiction. She is the winner of multiple awards, including the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Award, the Penn Syndicated Fiction Award, the California Young Reader Medal and Jane Addams Peace Prize Honor Book Award, her fiction has been chosen for several honors, including the American Library Association, Association Notable Books of the Year, Best American Short Stories, Children's Choice Awards, and the National Council of Teachers of English Books for a Global Society Honor. That's just a few that I mentioned. There was a list about this long of her awards. Counting on Grace won the 2007 Notable Book and 2007 seven notable social studies trade book by the Junior Library Guild of the American Library Association. The Vermont Humanities Council also selected Counting on Grace for their 2007 Vermont Reads book. The parallels between the Vermont and Piedmont Carolina's textile industries and cultures make Counting on Grace a fitting selection for the first Gaston Reads community-wide project. Ms. Winthrop makes her home in New York City for half the, the year. For the remaining months, she lives in northwestern Massachusetts, two miles from the small Vermont, Vermont town where, the, where Counting on Grace is set. Again, I would like to thank Ms. Winthrop for her willingness to be a part of our community project, and I will turn the microphone over to her. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you and all of the people who have made me feel so incredibly welcome here and uh, have made Grace so much a part of their lives. Um, it's been a fabulous event. And, and I love the way it all has woven together. And I think when you see this show, you'll kind of see why that means so much to me. Um, Particularly the title, Standing on a Box. That's just a really important way to talk about how ch children worked in the mills. So I had no intention, frankly, of writing anything like this uh, when I started. And I just wanted to say that this is the first um, time I've ever written a novel based on a photograph. And maybe we should just now take time to turn off all cell phones. <laughs> I understand. I hope mine is off. I think the battery's dead, so that's useful. Anyway, I've written you know, books for children, books for adults, short stories, picture books. But um, I walked into a museum, and I had no intention of writing this book. I didn't know what I was doing there. But I want to take you back and sort of walk you through the creative process 
that came into writing Counting on Grace. And then I will tell you another side of the story. So we're going to start with photograph. I don't know, are we going to turn the lights down or just keep them here? What do you think, Juliet? I th um, do they all go off? I can't, I forgot to, okay, then let's leave it like this. You can see fine like this. So it started with this photograph. Uh, it's of a 12-year-old girl who worked in a mill in Vermont. But I'm gonna back up a little bit from this and show you what I was working on when I came to this. So I had been asked by my publisher to write a book for a series that was the, called the Dear Mr. President series. And um, the idea was that you created a child and had her write to a president and you revealed history through the writing back and forth. So I uh, decided I wanted to write about the Great Depression in the Northeast. Um, it certainly was done by lots of people in this area, and it certainly was done by Steinbeck and others in the West, but I didn't feel like children really had access to that story. So I had moved to the Berkshires, to northwestern Massachusetts, just before this um, mandate came down to me. And I moved five miles from a town called North Adams. And North Adams had one of the biggest mills in the Northeast. It was called Arnold Print Works, and it features in Counting on Grace. So I set my book in North Adams. And in the book, Emma Bartoletti, who's the little girl on the right, of course, is the child of Italian immigrants. And her parents work in the mills. So my publisher went to the, to the Library of Congress website where you can use any of the images free of charge, and the publishers were worried about money, as usual. And so they put this picture in, imagining that Emma's mother might have looked like this. This is actually a woolen mill, not a cotton mill, as I pointed out to my publisher, but it was sort of the idea of what the Italian woman might have looked like. But this got me interested in mills, and interested in the way they looked. And then I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if Emma herself had worked in the mill, not her parents? Well, right about that time, I heard about a museum show that was happening in Bennington Museum, and it was Lewis Hines' child labor pictures from New England, specifically from Vermont. So I took myself up to that museum show with no idea why, particularly, except, well, I'm just following up on Dear Mr. President, and I saw my girl. Now, there were a lot of pictures in the show. Uh, there were pictures of a number of kids outside of mills, there was, but there was only one picture of one child, and that was Grace. Um, and if you step back and you look at this picture from the point of view of a writer, there are a lot of things that you can look for. First of all, I asked myself, what's in her pocket? That's a very interesting question, you know, for, for a writer to imagine. Is it lint? Is it waste from the machines? Is it a handkerchief that she could spit into? Is it her lunch? I asked myself, you know, she's dressed in a filthy smock. So I figure this kid had one smock. She probably had one Sunday dress and one smock. Her feet are bare, so it is probably summertime, but it's pretty scary to be working on that big a machine with bare feet. The floor is covered with grease, and one of the other pictures, her feet are really covered in grease. I looked at her hair. That's not the hair of your typical 12-year-old these days, and it's obviously tied up for a reason. Um, I learned later in my research that in 1907, one child was so badly scalped by a spinning frame, she lost her entire head of hair and was in the hospital seven months and testified before the United States Congress about the experience. That's obviously why they tied the girl's hair up and tried to keep it out of the spinning frame. Her left arm, looks to me as if uh, it had been broken and not set properly, but actually somebody else said they thought she probably had rickets, which was, of course, not enough um, 
vegetables usually, and so she had some kind of malnourishment issue. But the most interesting thing for a writer about this picture is the way she react, reacts to the machine. It's as if it's her best friend. She's leaning against the wall of this machine. This is an enormous machine. It's, uh, in some of the biggest frames would go from that wall to that wall. And Grace had to doff six frames, that's 12 sides, and at one point she tells you how many bobbins it is. I can't quite remember, but I think it's 1,632 bobbins a day, at least, if she doffs just once. She is a doffer. To doff simply means to do off. She, her job, when the machine is shut down, is to take each one of these bobbins off and replace it with an empty one. So her mother can jiggle the rail and start the machine up again. These are roving creels. The, uh, the thread going around these creels is much fatter than what goes around the bobbins. The child is not supposed to deal with the roving creels. The spinner, the person who runs the frame does that. But Grace, my character, is a very impulsive person. Um, she worked for $2.50 a week. She worked six hours, six days a week, 12 hours a day. That's probably about $40 a week now. Um, so I got very involved with this young woman, this girl, this picture very quickly. And the question that why did this picture draw me? And I think it's because the photographer makes her so human. He sees her right at her level. She, he's not talking down to her. He's not looking down at her. And this photographer, whose name was Lewis Hine, once said, I've always been more interested in persons than in people, in individuals. So as a novelist, so have I. So I thought, well, at least let me go find out who this man is. I'm not yet committed to writing a book. I'm just going to find out who Lewis Hine is. So Lewis Hine was born in 1874 in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. In his senior year in high school, his father died very suddenly, and he had to support the family by working in a furniture factory. He hated the work. He wanted to be a teacher. It was mind-numbing work. It was debilitating. He's quite a short man. It was very hard for him. He was still determined to get out of that factory. He never forgot that experience. He went to the normal school, which was what the school was called that taught teachers. And he, at the very last year, he got to the University of Chicago. And he met a great social progressive named Felix Adler, who started a school in New York City called the Ethical Culture School, which is still a very good private school in New York. He convinced Hine to come to New York and he gave Hein his first camera. And he said, Mr. Hein, learn how to use this camera, teach the kids how to use it, and that's what Lewis Hein did. In 1904, Hein went to Ellis Island because someone said, you've got to photograph the people, the waves of immigrants coming through Ellis Island. So he went to Ellis Island and he did photographs like this. Now, Hein was very worried about what would happen to the people coming into America. They thought it was a land of promise, but he knew even from his experience that they could very well get chewed up and spat out by the great maw of American capitalism. In 1907, he went to Pittsburgh to work on a report called the Pittsburgh Survey, and there he met a steel worker. And he said to him, what's it like for you to live in America? And the man said, I don't live in America. He said, America happens over my head. I never forgot that. So what he did was he followed the children all over the United States. From 1908 to 1917, he traveled approximately 50,000 miles a year following the children in their work. He found them in the glass factories in West Virginia. He found breaker boys in the coal fields in Pennsylvania. These boys are usually between the ages of 8 and 12. Their job is when the coal comes down the chutes, they have to lean over and take out the scrap pieces, the bad pieces. If they're lucky, they have gloves. If they're not lucky, their hands are going to get really badly cut up. This boy is not much older, and he has a stick, and his job is to poke them in the back 
so they don't fall either into the chute or fall asleep. Again, if the boy's lucky, he's figured out a way to give himself a backrest. A lot of them haven't. The air is unbelievable, of course, in those breaker boy rooms in the mines. This is a picture of Manuel. He is five years old. He picks shrimp for a living. The most distressing part of this picture, Mr. Hines said, is that all of these oyster shells were shucked by children. I don't know if you've ever shucked an oyster, but it requires a pick, and you, you get it in there, and inevitably your fingers get cut, and then the salt water, the brine, comes up from the oyster. He also took a picture of a little girl picking cotton in the south. So let me read you what my character Delia, Grace's older sister, says about this little girl. Delia is combing Grace's hair, getting her ready to go for her first day in the mill. Think about a cotton-picking girl, smaller than you, dragging a bag behind her through the fields. She lives in the south. It's hot all the time. She snatches the cotton from the plants, one hand snatch, two hand snatch, step, one hand, two hand, step. That sounds like Papa calling a dance, I say. Delia straightens my head and starts the comb, working through another clump of hair. The cotton travels on the train from the southern pickers to the northern doffers. I close my eyes and imagine a long white rope stretching from that cotton picking girl all the way to me. Now I could show you pictures for hours of Lewis Hine children. They harvested beets and cranberries, they sewed lace, they sold newspapers, and I looked at all of those faces, but I could not forget my girl, the one in Vermont. The caption under her picture read, Anemic Little Spinner in Cotton Mill, North Panel, Vermont, 1910. And it suddenly occurred to me that I lived two or three miles from where that cotton mill stood. So at the very least, I'm still not writing a story, of course, I could go look at the mill site. I didn't know what would have happened to the mill. So I drove over there, and I parked my car in the lot, and I followed the railroad tracks. Mills need two things to do their job. The railroad, to bring in the cotton, the unprocessed cotton, and, and to take away the cloth when it's made, and the river, the river, of course, to run the machines. So here is what Grace Forcier, my character, would tell you about the river. The mill needs the river, but the river don't need the mill. The water was flowing along for thousands of years, and then the people come and dammed up the river. So it got fatter, and the current got strong enough to turn the water wheel. This time of year in the spring, the river runs high and proud, and the wheel never stops, which means the machines got all the power they need until the summertime when the water can go slack. The river don't seem to mind. Borrow my water, it says, long as you give it back. Trouble is, when the mill spits the water out, it comes all dirty and it smells queer. The mill wasn't there anymore, but to my surprise, I found a historical marker at the site of where the mill used to be. So here's the mill in the days when it was thriving, in the days when the little girl worked there. And here's what I learned about the history of the mill from that historical marker. It was a grist mill and a woolen mill, and then in 1859 the railroad came. And here's a picture of the mill store in those days where all the mill workers shopped. And then I swung around, and I looked, and I realized it was still there. And just beyond that, there were long rows of houses that had been built for the mill workers. And I went around the corner, and I saw a sign up the hill that said, French Hill Road, private. And up at the top of that hill, I saw all these small houses clustered together. The people who lived on French Hill must have come down from Canada to work in the mill. As Grace says at one point, there ain't no Polish hill and there ain't no Irish hill. There's just a French hill. The only other hill there is is Snake Hill. And her mother says, that's where the superintendent lives. <laughs> so the story was starting in my head 
and now I was helpless to stop it. Now, a child labor investigator named E.F. Brown is the one, I think, who convinced Lewis Hine to come into this tiny little mill in nowhere, Vermont. And he had listed that little girl's name as Addie Laird. I had no interest in Addie Laird. I had no interest in finding out who she was or what her story was. I simply wanted to use her face to create my own character. So, my character's name was Grace Forcier, and she was going to live on French Hill because her family had emigrated from Canada, and she would go to the mill school, and she would shop at the mill store, and I went back and I stood on the side of the mill many times when I was writing this book, and I would position myself on the bank above the river and close my eyes. So behind me, I could imagine that girl in a dirty smock standing on the second floor of the tall brick building. She is stealing a moment from her machines to look outside. She cups her ear, trying to hear the bubble of the falling water. She rubs a circle in the dirt of the window, trying to see a bird fly by or the yellowing leaves. But then she's gone again, and she's called back to the spinning frame by the mother who runs it. But more often than not, her body has become completely tuned to the machine. She knows when it's time for her to go back. Hein talked a lot about that. Who's in charge here, the machine or the person? He was very, very conscious of that. It turned out that Hein took a number of pictures that day at the mill, and my girl appears in three of them. First of all, you have to see that this group definitely wanted Mr. Hine to know that they were the baseball team, because they've got their baseball there. The kids could smoke, of course, didn't matter how old you were. This is one of my favorite boys, and you're gonna see him in the next picture, too. I named him Doogie. I made him the child of Irish parents. This is the little girl, who I named Grace. And when I looked at this picture, I realized that she was leaning on somebody's shoulder. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna give Grace a sister. And I named her Delia, and she is a typical big sister, very bossy. Stand still, Grace. Delia sounds like my teacher, Miss Leslie. Why is everybody always telling me the same thing? I'm not doing nothing wrong. Keep your smock away from that frame. You need to mind. I already know what to do. You don't have to show me. We are shouting at each other, even louder than you need to in the spinning room. She won't let me touch anything. How am I supposed to know how to do it if you keep pushing me aside? By watching, she says, smacking my fingers when they get close. I found another group picture, and this is where you will see Doogie. <sighs> He is irresistible. And I really focused in this picture on the girl's hair. They worked hard on those hairdos, and so did Delia. Delia sits me on the bed. Every girl in the mill has to have her hair bound up so it don't get caught in the machines. Nobody's bothered with my hair since before mass on Sunday, so Delia's taking out five days of knots. I try to pull away from her, but Delia's fingers are strong from three years in the mill. She holds tight. I don't cry out. I don't ever let on that something hurts me. I'd rather drink my own blood. Now, if Lewis Hine couldn't talk his way into the mill, he would gather kids together as they were leaving and take a picture of them. This afternoon, I went to the Gaston Museum of History, and they have this fabulous show of Lewis Hine. I don't know if you've seen it, and the photographs that were he took. He actually did get into the Luray Mill, because there are some inside, but there are lots and lots of pictures outside. Somebody took this picture of him somewhere in the south, taking pictures of kids outside of mill housing. In North Pownall, he gathered the boys together and took a picture of just them. And I tried to imagine what it would be like for him to get them all to hold still. I know about these things because I have five brothers. <laughs> I could never have gotten them all to stand still. So that gave me a scene later in the book where Grace, he gets Grace to help him. Now, the only reason the boys pay me any mind is because they aren't sure about this man, and they are especially careful around the camera 
but they do keep horsing around and falling over each other in shifting places, and their hats are all skewed funny. And Hubert and Pierre Gagnon, they lounge about with their arms around each other's shoulders as if this picture-taking happens every day. But then I knew more than anything that Grace would need a friend. She was going to go through a lot, and she just couldn't make it without a friend. And so I gave her Arthur. He looked to me like a boy who understood from the beginning what the mill was doing to all of them. He didn't horse around like Hubert and Pierre and Doogie. He was serious. Here they are in school with Miss Leslie, the teacher, speaking first. Grace. I want you to stay in one place when you read. Stop hopping around the room. Look at Arthur. He can sit still. Now you try it. Arthur's desk is hooked up to mine, and he never moves a muscle, excepting his lips when he's reading. That's why Miss Leslie likes him the best. It's not only because he's the best reader. It's because he's a sitter, and the rest of us are hoppers, jumpers, and fidgeters. I find teachers like that line better than any. The book grew. The research grew. I went to the American Textile History Museum. I learned how to doff bobbins from an 86-year-old man who had trained mill workers in the 40s. I learned about photographic techniques. I looked at glass plate negatives. I got inside of mill houses. I listened to French Canadian music. And I wrote. And then one day, the book was done. Grace walked out of the pages. She was fully formed. That's usually when I'm done. That's when the book's over, usually. But I was haunted by Addie. There was a little girl whose picture had been published all over the world, and nobody knew who she was, and nobody knew what happened to her. And when I first started looking for her, it was about curiosity, and it ended up to be kind of a crusade. So Addie's picture was on a postage stamp in 1998, a 32-cent stamp. And I read in this Vermont paper that the US Postal Service had tried to find the real little girl back in the census, but they couldn't. So I thought, well, I'm going to try. So I went to the National Archives in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where they have a program called Ancestry.com. You can now buy it for your computer. Anybody who's researching their genealogy knows it. In those days, it was only on the computer at the uh, National Archives. And you can put in Addie, North Panel, Vermont, 1910. Nothing. So I thought, well, maybe she was French Canadian, so her name maybe was Adeline. So I put in Adeline, North Panel, Vermont, 1910. Nothing. So I thought, three strikes, you're out. So Addie, Adelaide. So I put in Adelaide, and bingo. Up came Adelaide Harris. There was an Adelaide Harris who lived in North Panel, Vermont, 1910. So I said, OK. I went back into the microfiche room, and I put on the spool, and I scrolled through everything, and bingo. On sheet 12B in Bennington County, Vermont, on May 4, 1910, a census worker named George E. Corey recorded in flowery, fading handwriting the two Card sisters, Anna, female, 14 years of age, white, single, spinner in the cotton factory, and Addie, female, white, 12 years of age, single, spinner in the cotton factory, both living with their grandmother, a Mrs. Adelaide Harris. So Addie's name never was Laird. It was Card, Addie Card. Now in 1910, some shyster sold watered-down ink to the Census Bureau. So anybody who's done any research on the 1910 census wants to go stick a gun to their head because great swaths of our ancestors' lives have literally melted into the paper. You cannot read about three quarters of the 1910 census. But I knew how old Addie was, so I went back to 1900. And I decided to really look for her in that census. And I found her. So here you go. Addie is on the bottom line here, niece, two years old. Annie, four years old. Their father, Emmett Card, 
their grandmother, Adelaide, and their uncle, who at the age of 16 is listed as head of household. Not the mother, who's in her 50s. Interesting. But Emmett Card is the most interesting, because when you follow the line over to this little weird letter, it's a W. It means that Emmett Card was a widower already in 1900. So by the time Addie was two, she had already lost her mother. So I went to the panel town office to try and figure out what had happened. And I discovered lots of things. The first thing I found was Addie's birth record. So she was born in 1898. You follow it down here, December 6, Susan Harris Card and Emmett Card gave birth to a female baby who was alive. Unlike her cousin, who had a male, there was a male Harris born earlier that year, stillborn. So her birthday is December 6th, 1898. I discovered that Addie's mother had died of peritonitis, probably from a burst appendix when Addie was two. Her father was a terrible drunkard and fled very soon after that 1900 census. He died years later in North Adams. I don't think Addie ever saw him again. One of the worst stories was her cousin Rosa. Rosa, at the age of three, died from the effects of burns caused by lighting matches and setting her clothes on fire. Probably Rosa was being babysit, sat by her older brother Frank, who was five. The rest of the people would have been in the mill. Addie's grandfather died while she was living with them, but I couldn't find Addie. And I figured she was in a graveyard somewhere. I just didn't know what had happened to her. So I was packing up my stuff to leave. I thought, OK, I dug her out of the dustbin of history. I got her name right. That's the end of the story. And a woman who'd gotten interested in my, my whole process said, let me just look one other place. And she went back into the bank vault, and there was this terrifying scream. And she came running out with this huge book. And she said, I swear, Addie pushed this book off the shelf. She wanted you to know where she had gone. Addie got married. At the age of 17, she married one Edward Hatch. And of course, she met him in the cotton factory. They were both 17. He was a spinner. All those pictures I showed you of the boys, I believe somewhere in there is Edward Hatch, but I've never been able to find him. So I then went to the 1920 census, where, of course, I discovered that's where Addie was. Here she is with her mother-in-law, Bethany Hatch, Cornelius, Earl, Margaret, and John, 19, 16, 15, 13, all working as spinners in the cotton factory, and Addie Hatch, daughter-in-law, female, white, 22 years old, married. Her husband is not on this list. I found him on the SS New Jersey and Boston Harbor in the 1920 census. He had joined the Navy, anything to get out of the cotton factory. So at that point, I, I got this piece of information, and then I had to switch back down to New York City. And so I went back up French Hill, and I imagined that Addie was with me. 107 years old, standing next to me. And side by side, we look down the hill, and she says to me, the mill's gone. I say, yep, it's all gone. She says, my eyes ain't so good anymore. What's that down there? And I say, that is a historical marker and a flag, and that marker's got your name on it. So we walk down the hill together so that she can read it. And she takes a look, and she's really mad. She said, I worked in that mill for 14 years. They didn't get my first name right, and they didn't get my second name right. And I say, listen, Addie, I have good news for you. Your picture is famous. You were on a postage stamp in 1998, the year you would have been 100. I don't care about that, she says. Listen, I say, you were on a postage stamp with a whole bunch of really famous people, like Woodrow Wilson, Charlie Chaplin, Jack Dempsey. She said, I don't care about that. I said, Addie, you were in a Reebok ad. She said, what's a Reebok? <laughs> she said, you make them get my name right. 
That's when it began to turn into a crusade. So I hired a friend of mine, a researcher, to help me find Addie. And he was like a hound dog with a lead. He could not give up. In four weeks, four weeks from the day I brought him in to the search, he was standing next to her grave. We found out everything. First of all, Addie had a baby girl named Ruth in 1919, but custody was taken away from her. She was put in that mill at the age of eight. She was pulled out of school. She did not read what she was signing. She signed away the custody of her child to her sister-in-law, who did not have to work in the mill. So Ruth was brought up by her husband's sister. And if you go back to that 1920 census, there's no Ruth here, right? She's not listed. We learned from public records that in 1925, Addie and her husband, Edward, were divorced. And by that time, Addie had renamed herself Pat. She did not like the name Addie. We don't know who Steve was. Then Addie remarried, and she adopted a little girl she named Elaine. And Elaine grew up and got married to a man named George. Elaine and George and Addie moved to New York City so that Addie could babysit the children when they came. Here they are, Addie and Elaine, sitting in a car in Times Square on Victory in Europe Day, May 1945. Addie is in the back seat, for all the world looking like Faye Dunaway and Bonnie and Clyde. This is her adopted daughter, Elaine. Keep that picture in mind. Remember Elaine, because you're going to meet a relative of hers. So this is actually a studio. That's a cardboard car. That's a cardboard man. That's a big sign that says, War Ends. So clearly, there were studios that were set up all over New York saying, hey, we can make you look like you were in Times Square. Elaine had two children, Larry and Bobby, and Addie insisted that they be baptized, which was interesting because she wasn't much of a churchgoer herself. So here she is with Larry and Bobby. Here she is on her 90th birthday. Here is Addie with her great-granddaughters, and she lived long enough to meet her great-great-granddaughter. Addie was 94 years old when she died. That skinny little girl with rickets who worked in that mill for all those years made it to 94. We know all this because my friend Joe tracked down these relatives. And a couple of weeks after we had finished the whole search and we had called them up, we went to see them. So this is Addie's great-granddaughter, Piper Lee, who looks so much like her grandmother, Elaine. It's amazing. And we met with her and her mom, Kathleen, and we were, that's my friend Joe, and we talked about Addie. They did not know she was on a postage stamp. They did not know her picture has been published a hundred times. They knew nothing about Mr. Hine. They did not even know Addie's birthday because Addie was two when her mother died. Nobody bothered to remember her birthday. We knew her birthday. They told us that Addie had been put on a soapbox, standing on a soapbox at the age of eight to be sent into the mill to work. They told us that she loved her grandmother, Harris, and we told them that her grandmother died five days after she married Eddie Hatch. They told us that Addie had a nervous breakdown at the age of 13. So that would have been one year after Lewis Hine took her picture. She was shaking so much she could no longer hold the bobbins. So they took her home, and basically her grandmother had to tie her into bed. 12 hours a day, that little girl got tied into her bed so she didn't run away and she didn't get into trouble while the rest of the family went into the mill. For those of you who've read Counting on Grace, you know that a major character in the book gets tied into his bed. I knew nothing about Addie when I wrote that. That was a very eerie experience for me. The story kept going on. In the town of North Pownall in 1937, the mill closed because they outsourced all the labor to North Carolina and South Carolina. 
It was cheaper down here. So they closed all those northeastern mills. And they turned around and they usually sold the mill housing to the mill workers who lived there. So Jean Harris, in 1937, bought a mill house. Remember, in that 1900 census, that Jean Harris was the 16-year-old who was listed as head of household. He bought this house for a dollar. This part of it was not there. The, the present owner told me when he got it from the Harrises, just this section was there. All of this was added on afterwards. He said it wasn't much bigger than a chicken coop. It's in walking distance of the mill, and it's almost sure Addie spent part of her life there. A little later on, you will remember the picture I have of the boys in the mill. So I met a terrific guy named Bud Willette, who's 80 years old. And he told me that this is his Uncle Lawrence. The guy I named Arthur, he said, that's my Uncle Lawrence. And he said, this is his big brother, Eugene. He said, my Uncle Gene. And then Bud said to me, you know, I think you ought to come meet my son, Tony. <laughs> is that amazing? <laughs> I said to Tony, uh, want to take that earring out of your ear so I can take your picture? He said, no, ma'am. <laughs> so I said, all right, Tony. So, you know, it's like here. The descendants of the mill workers are all still living here, are all still living in North Panel, lots of them. And I feel as if somehow we all stand on the shoulders of these little kids that went into those mills and worked. It started because I saw this face in a museum. And when you begin a book, you never know how long this journey's going to be. You never know how long the ride will take you. This was one wild ride. But I had another job to do. So I wrote the Library of Congress, and I told them they had to fix Addie's name. And they did it within a matter of weeks. So if you go on the Library of Congress website now and you put in Lewis Hine, North Panel, Vermont, you'll see it says Addie Card. Then I wrote to the Environmental Protection Agency in Boston. They were responsible for taking the mill down. And the reason is, after the mill closed in the 30s, it was bought by a tannery. And they tanned hides in that mill for years and years and years and polluted the Hoosick River so badly that it became an EPA Superfund site. And the woman at the EPA told me they tried to preserve the mill, but there were too many contaminants in the bricks and in the walls. So they took it down brick by brick. And they put up the historical marker to mark where it had been. And I said to them, well, guess what? You got our name wrong, first and last. And the woman made me prove it. I had to send lots of, of my research to her. But she agreed in the end that she had gotten the name wrong. And so they redid the sign. So I imagine taking Addie up French Hill one more time, and I say, hey, they did a sign for you. And they got it right. And she finally stopped haunting me. So it was, as I say, a wild ride. And remember I told you that Lewis Hine once said, I am more interested in persons than in people. Because he takes the photograph at Addie's level, until 1917, and he was hammering away at the same thing over and over again. I wonder what he would say today about the children in Honduras who stitch our soccer balls, or the six-year-old boy who works in a rug factory so that we can buy those really cheap rugs at Walmart. The problem has not going away. One in 12 children in the world work in child labor. That's 246 million children not getting educated, not getting much of a future. The problem hasn't gone away. Now, the children in a hind picture stare out at us with a remarkable mixture of sorrow and pride and pluck. Because he saw each one of them as a separate human being, he forces us to do the same. That's why his pictures haunt us to this day. 
That's why I had to go find Addie. And Hein also said, if I could tell the story in words, I wouldn't need to lug around a camera. So he gave the world Addie in a picture, and I decided to tell a story about her in words. And that's how Grace was born. Thank you. So we have wonderful things to eat downstairs, I understand, and books. But I also have time for some questions, if anybody has any questions about Addie, Grace, the writing process, the mills, how much money I make. <laughs> Kids always ask me that, and I always make them do a math problem, so. <laughs> yeah. That was a very sad story. Lewis Hine, in 1917, he decided to go to, to Europe, and he did incredible photographs. There's a wonderful book by Dale Kaplan called uh, something like Hine in Europe, The Lost Photographs. He did incredible photographs of the refugees after World War I. Then he came back, and he didn't do any more child labor because he didn't want to get, you know, he had done that. He then did an amazing book called Men at Work, and he photographed the men building the, the Empire State Building. And the thing that I was always impressed about was he went higher than they did. They are an amazing set of photographs. He did women at work. The sad thing that happened to him in World War II, he had been, I mean, in uh, the Great Depression, he had been labeled as kind of a hard man to work with because he was very perfectionist about how his photographs were printed. So when it came around to the WPA and the Works Progress Administration, the great Dorothea Lange, etc., they wouldn't hire Hein. Bernice Abbott, his friend, tried to get Roy Stryker to hire him because he was hiring all the people who went out and did the photographs and the dust bowl, etc. They wouldn't hire him. He died almost penniless in 1940, I think it was. His wife had died just 18 months before of a sudden case of pneumonia. He had a very unhappy relationship with his only son, whose name is Coridon, or Coridon. I don't know how to say it exactly. But of course, Hein was on the road, 50,000 miles a year. He did not develop a relationship with his son, so there was unhappiness there. When I was in Vermont for the entire year they did Vermont, the Vermont Reads was counting on grace, I met Hein's niece. She lives in Middlebury, Vermont. And she's a wonderful woman. She remembers Uncle Lou coming and, and developing photographs in their house. And he lived in Hastings, New York. But he had a sad end to his life. And his, he was forgotten for many years. Bernice Abbott really tried to keep his name up there. I think what really happened was he did the photographs as a way of saying, this is child labor. This is a social progressive movement. We have to stop this. What came, people came to later was that they were real works of art. They were, they are really works of art, those photographs. So that it was like he had to go into obscurity and then people looked at him again as an artist, not just a progressive. So that was the end of his tale. Other questions? Yes. Are you okay? All right, so if you want to know how much money I make. So let's pretend this book costs $16, all right? Usually a hardcover does. I get 10% of the list price. So how much do I get per book? Right, $1.60. So I get 10% up to 10,000 copies. And after that, I get 12.5%. So my royalty goes up a bit. I won't ask for that number, because I don't even know that number. I need a calculator. But here's what happens when they put out the paperback. This is what usually surprises people. When they put out the paperback, I get 8% of $6. So what am I making then? Six times eight is 48, right? I'm making 48 cents. So you buy 10 books, and what do I get? $4.80. 
You see why I have to publish as many books as I do? The other piece of it is that I'm paid in advance when I'm hired, you know, or when I submit this book and they say, yes, we're going to publish it, they give me an advance. An advance is an interest-free loan. You don't have to pay it back, but you have to work it off in those increments of $1.60. So if I'm paid in advance $10,000, I don't get any more money until they've sold enough books to make back that $10,000. It's a really rotten business. <laughs> It's not a rotten business, but it's a very hard business to make a living in. Yeah? Great. It's nothing like Arthur and those two fingers, right? <laughs> Yeah, there are statistics state by state. And I never really went and looked at the actual statistics, although I think Hein did. What I was struck by were his pictures. There's a picture he has down here, I don't think it's Gastonia, but somewhere in North Carolina, of a boy in a pork pie hat, no arm. And he talks a lot about, they were hideously maimed and hurt. You know, the kid, the girl who was scalped, they got near those machines, they treated the machines as playthings. They were often, when you go see the show at the History Museum, you know, there's a quote in there where they, the owners, the superintendent encouraged the kids to come in the mill, you know, all the time. I'll bring in the dinner pail. Yeah. Exactly. You get used to the machines, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and you almost kind of get a feeling of, oh, well, they're not so dangerous. But they were very, very dangerous to get around. The other incredible thing, of course, was the sawmills. They were, you know, the kids who ran those saws. Others? Yeah. When I'm working on a project, do I focus solely on that? It, it depends. Um, sometimes I'm writing poetry while I'm writing a novel. Sometimes I'm writing picture books. I'm usually writing picture books almost all the time. Um, what I've found now, having done this for so many years, is I will learn enough to get the book going. Then I will write up to where I don't know something, and then I'll go research. Then I'll write back to it. And this is so much better than what I used to do. So I wrote a novel called In My Mother's House for Adults. And I turned in the first draft. It was 250 pages. And it was, this novel was going to cover 70 years. I think I'd gotten through three years and 250 pages. And the editor said, we know more about Lydia's aunt's supper dress than we know about Lydia. And it's a great temptation if you love research to just keep researching, you know, up the wazoo. On the other hand, in this case, I feel as if one of the successes of Counting on Grace is that I know the iceberg. I only have to give the reader the tip. But the tip, the reader has to believe that I know the iceberg, or they will not enter the story. And the only way, they will not suspend their disbelief. And the only way that I can really know the iceberg is just to do an enormous amount of research. That's my system. I keep feeling that other people can do this quicker, but that's my system. So, yes, I am often working on more than one thing, but usually one is very primary. One is taking up most time. Yeah. What am I working on now? <laughs> okay, so I was saying to the kids earlier in school, uh, one of the fascinations for me of doing the Addy research, the genealogical research, was that I have never had to research my father's family. The reason for that is that my great-grandmother was Teddy Roosevelt's sister. So everybody has researched the Roosevelts to death. So I've never had to go look up any Roosevelts, right? So after I finished this book, I realized this is really kind of dumb, but I had never done much work on my mother's family. My mother's still alive. She's an amazing storyteller. And she witnessed the first battle of the Spanish Civil War from the roof of her parents' house because she grew up in Gibraltar. She sailed right through the evacuation of Dunkirk for reasons that are too long to explain, and she ended up working as a spy in London during World War II. She met my father, who parachuted behind enemy lines and worked with the Maquis, the French resistance. So that is the story I'm telling now. It's a memoir, and it's 
I don't know what it's going to end up. Right now I'm calling it setting the record straight. There was a question in the back. So I saw the picture in 2002 in the fall and I turned in my first draft in June 2004. The actual amount of writing time was much shorter than the research time. I, I really fell into this book. I fell in love with Grace. I had an extremely hard time finding the point of view. I kept writing third person past tense. Grace went to the store. Then I thought, well, I'm going to share the story with Lewis Hine. So he's going to be in there too. He's going to be Mr. Hine did this and that. That didn't work at all. It took the focus off of Grace. Finally, I started to write a journal from the point of view of Grace. And her voice just came right out on the page. And I did not expect to write the book first person present tense. I am going to the store, but because her voice was so alive in those journal pieces, that's what I ended up doing. And the thing that I had the most fun doing was forcing myself to do every metaphor that Grace uses must be from something she knows. I hate the way my family is flying all apart like the ends on my machine. You know, I like that she named the machines, the bad ones after boys, the good ones after saints. You know, she, there was something very playful and wacko and kind of impulsive about Grace. If she were here today, they would call her ADD. She's left-handed, she's impulsive, she cannot sit still, she learns kinesthetically, she must walk in order to read. They would, you know, she'd be labeled that. And I had that in mind. I thought, how hard would it be to be a left-handed doffer? So I did probably more than many of my other books. I, f I fell in love with this book and really got involved in it. Right behind you. My favorite type of writing, meaning fiction or poetry or sh Oh. My favorite type of writing is the kind of writing whatever I'm doing right then. I mean, last January, I'd done Grace, I had done all this kind of work for, to go out and talk about her, and I felt as if maybe I was never going to write another book. And it was making me very sad. So I sat down every single morning. As soon as I got up, I would go into my creative office, and I would sit down and I would write a poem. I wrote a poem a day from January 1st until May 1st. And for that period of time, that was my favorite kind of writing. I ended up writing a lot of poetry about my mother, my father, Dunkirk, you know, the bombs they'd gone through, the battles, that, and that has ended up back into the memoir. But I like going back and forth. Yeah? Did show her with another dress on? No, that was her smock. The smock, and when she's in that front, there's a smock. She, I'm almost sure she had a Sunday dress, but she had probably one smock. Yeah. It is. Writing my, is my only source of income. I make my living doing this, thanks to the wonderful friends of the Gastonia Library and the 17 other people they talk about. I mean, incredibly generous New North Carolina. But yes, I tour, and, um, but I make my living as a writer. It's, it's not easy, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And it goes very up and down. I have a movie deal in the making, not for Grace, but for a book I wrote called The Castle in the Attic, which is a big fantasy novel, got a lot of attention. And that's being made into a movie by Walden. Fingers crossed. Screenplay was delivered yesterday. I don't write the screenplay. So, you know, wow, this was a nice year. I got an option. But, you know, la year, last year, ooh, yucky, not good. <laughs> No social security last year, very bad. <laughs> I went to Sarah Lawrence College, where I arrived and they said, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a writer. And they said, okay, you can do that. And they put me completely in writing courses, which was unheard of in 1966. Yep. So these characteristics of Bryce, where she banged the machines, that is true? 
I, I imagined that for my story, but I'm pretty sure that it came out of all the research I did. I was saying to someone earlier that once I started the research, I researched in Vermont. I read Like a Family, which is a wonderful book written about this whole area and the mills here. I don't know what I picked from where, but there, were one, there are wonderful oral histories on the American memory site in the Library of Congress, French Canadians talking about coming down to the mills, what it was like when they'd been in the farmlands and had to come down. Like here, people coming from the mountains who had been on the farms and came down to get work in the mills. There are so many parallels, but then I make a leap. I mean, for example, in the book, when Pepe is wandering around and giving them all trouble, he's, he's the grandfather, he's not making any sense, they're worried about him, they tie him into bed. They tie him into bed. Then I find that Addie was tied into bed for a whole year. So somehow, if you get deep enough into the research, I believe, I always say about historical fiction, I'm not saying it happened, I'm saying it could have happened. My research must be as absolutely true as it can. Then I can let my imagination go. You've been a great audience. Let's go eat or whatever. Thank you.
Robinson. Great. I worked in the mail 54 years ago. You did. For how long? Which mail? Robinson Mail. Really? Yeah, right over the Yeah, Yeah, I went to the museum down in Dallas. That's right. Do you want me to sign it to you or just sign it? To Ralph Robinson. Okay. Spell Robinson. I got it. Is it one B? B. Yeah. Robinson. And that's my great grandmother's name, so maybe we're related. Wow. Robinson.